welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. You have me and the fabulous Christopher. Christopher, tell us who we've got on. Hi, Alina. I'm pleased to say that we have Kenneth McInnes, who is a journalist and historian who's lived and worked in Russia for 20 years. And he's here to talk to us about his first book, When Russia Did Democracy from St. Vladimir to Tsar Putin, who is one of your favourite people, I believe. My favourite people. (laughs) My favourite people. You do realise where I'm located right now, don't you, Chris? (laughs) I think you mentioned it once or twice. Ah, fair enough. Hi, Kenny. Welcome to the podcast. (laughs) Hello. Thank you very much. Okay, Alina, well, we better move away from Putin and uh, before we get libeled. So moving into the questions. In Britain, we don't tend to think much of Russian history before the Napoleonic invasion and uh, in 1812. And then again, sort of nothing happens until, the, until 1905. But the origin of the country is a lot, lot older. Um, what, what are those sort of origins? So the birth date is roughly the same as that of our own countries. Um, For example, the Kingdom of Scotland, where I'm from, traditionally dates from 843 AD, while England was unified in the year 927. So we're talking roughly about the second half of the ninth century, i.e. around the lifetime of Alfred the Great, to give a bit of context. So um, at that time, the East Slavic tribes who are inhabiting the lands, which eventually become Russia, Ukraine, Belarus. They don't have any state, but they have for centuries been governing themselves through a popular assembly called a Vetsche. Now, the word comes from the same root as the modern word Soviet, and and this was a democratic assembly where every man had the vote. Now, according to the primary chronicle, which uh, was written a couple of centuries after the event, Um, A Scandinavian prince called Rurik was, in the year 862, invited to rule over Novgorod, which is in the northwest of Russia. Then, 20 years later, his successor, Alek, left Novgorod and travelled south um, down to the much richer town of Kiev. He made Kiev the capital of a federation of principalities known as Kievan Rus which stretched all the way from Scandinavia down to the Black Sea. So the princes had to contend with the local democracy, and you had a system of dual power. And there are two variations of this. You had most of Kievan Rus, where the power of the prince competed with the Vecce, but you also had uh, Novgorod, which was increasingly left its own affairs, and where the Vecce was in um, more control and um, um, it elected its own governor, it elected its own prince, and it became a separate republic in 1136. So you have these very democratic foundations already existing right at the very um, birth of the Russian state. And this continued up until the end of the 15th century, um, after the Mongol invasion, which which happened in the 13th century and shook things up a, a little bit because the Mongols came. Now, they would only deal with the princes. They weren't interested in dealing with the people, and the princes could rely on Mongol troops to put down any rebellions. So that gave the princes um, a bit of the upper hand over the people. Then, as the Mongol Empire declined and the and split up, and then the Golden Horde part, which controlled the Russian lands, also declined, um, a new kid on the block came up, and this was the principality of Moscow. Um, and there the Grand Prince was firmly in control, and he expanded his control over all the other Russian lands, uniting them under his sway, under the Russian autocracy. And this wasn't like the old Russian princes of Kiev, um, the, because the Muscovite princes, they took a lot from their former Mongol overlords. And the result was um, the Russian autocracy, which spread over the whole the whole of these Russian lands 
by the end of the 15th century. So by the reign of Ivan IV, there's quite a balancing act between the autocracy of Tsars versus the Boya Duma. But Ivan creates something else. Can you tell us what the Zelensky Sodor is? Okay, so I'll quite say there was a balancing act between the Tsar and the Boyars Duma, which was simply the advisory council of noblemen, because the Tsar he was the autocrat, he was in complete control, but there were variations, for example, Ivan III, he would consult with this um, Duma, the Boyars Duma, and he liked to debate with them sometimes, uh, whereas his son, Basil III, was more like his Byzantine mother, and he took decisions without consulting this organ, but it was always under the thumb of the Tsar. The difference was that when, um, in 1533, Basil III died, and the throne passed to his three-year-old son, Ivan IV, who grew up into Ivan the Terrible. This meant that the boyars in the sort of power gap, the boyars came to power for over a decade as regents during his minority. But instead of using this chance to legislate and permanently limit the autocracy, they simply engaged in an orgy of killings, seizing power from one another, and using it for as long as they could hold on to it. Now, they also mistreated the young Tsar, the young Ivan, who said that he was denied food, denied clothes. And um, so when he grew up and at the age of 16 decided to crown himself as Tsar in 1547, he wanted revenge against these boyars. Now, shortly after his coronation in 1547, there were fires followed by riots in Moscow because the people had also suffered under the boyar rule. Now, the Tsar was frightened by the violence. At one point, there was a mob turned up in his palace um, demanding that he hand over his grandmother because she was accused of starting the fires. Um, to his credit, Ivan didn't hand over his grandmother to the crowd, but he realised that he had to um, get the people on side. He knew to rule over a big territory, and he couldn't be sure that the boyars would implement his decrees or report truthfully back to him about the state of the land. But above all, he wanted revenge against the boyars. So what he did um, in 1549 was he took the momentous step of creating a rival consultative organ to the boyars' Duma. He summoned representatives of the whole land to a grand meeting in Moscow, which evolved into the country's first ever national parliament. And this was called a Zemsky Sabor. Now, the word Sabor, it just means gathering or assembly in Russian. Back in the day, it was just called Sabor. Later in the 19th century, historians added the term Zemsky, Zemsky Sabor, which means land, just to distinguish it from the church assembly. Now, it was very like the contemporary European parliaments of the 16th century, such as you had in Scotland, France, Spain, mm -hmm. when you had representatives of the three estates sitting in a single chamber. So you had the metropolitan and the senior clergy, the first estate, you had the Boyer's Duma, the second estate, and then you had the land, meaning members of every other class in Russian society. The kept tradesmen and peasants at the first sabor, although they did take part in later assemblies. This first sabor of 1549 was called the Assembly of Reconciliation, because they were called to hear all the abuses of power which had been committed by the Boyers during Ivan's minority and of course to lay the blame and direct the people's wrath against the boyars. But the tradition continued, and there were as many as 10 Zemsky Sabors convened during the reign of um, Ivan the Terrible. I mean, it was a bit like its contemporary Tudor parliament, if we're talking the 16th century here, and it was very much a tool in the hand of the monarch, and it usually gave, let the monarch hear, gave its decisions that it knew that the monarch wanted to hear, but nevertheless, um, for example, in the assembly called in 1566 to discuss the Livonian War, um, it's those representatives of the people, including the middle classes, debating important matters of state, determining the course of Russian foreign policy. Although during the 16th century, it wasn't elected. That only came in the, later in the 17th century. They, they, they're going to have quite a bit of a, an influence, though, in the appointment of Boris Gudon. Oh, I'm going to click my teeth in. Boris Gudunov. Yes, that's right. It came in quite useful because in 1598, uh, Ivan Terrible's son, Fyodor, 
um, died without any heirs. Now, um, in his will, he extracted a promise from his wife, Irina Godunova, um, to become a nun after his death. But Irina Godunova claimed that he had actually bequeathed the throne to her. And she declared her intention to rule just for a short period of time. Um, incidentally, I think she was inspired by the English example because she had corresponded with Queen Elizabeth. And um, she well knew that in, in England, they'd had an unbroken line of queens for the whole second half of the 16th century. Um, although, but in Russia, a woman had never ruled in her own right. And Irina might have wanted to have been like Queen Elizabeth I. She ended up being like Lady Jane Grey because she only ruled for nine days. The people of Moscow rioted. They called her shameless. And so um, she hastily um, relinquished power to the boy or Stuma and retired to a uh, nunnery. And so um, the government of the country passed to the patriarch who summoned a Zemsky Sabor to elect a new Tsar. Now, um, the patriarch named um, his name was Job um, uh, Job from the named after the, the biblical um, um, prophet Job. Um, he played the main role in holding the election. Um, on the 16th of January 1598, charters were sent to all the towns informing the people that Irina had abdicated and that Azemsky Sabor was being called to elect a new Tsar. And this was the first time that a Russian Tsar had ever been chosen by the people, and it set a precedent for the next hundred years. A job was indebted to Irina's brother, Boris Godunov, for his promotion to the rank of Russia's first ever um, patriarch, and he supported his candidacy. So he wasn't confident of success in a nationwide vote. So instead of convening a full Zemsky Sabor of the whole land, he only summoned representatives from Moscow. Now, assembled at his palace in February 1598, and it consisted of um, almost 500 delegates, mainly from the upper classes, although the middle classes did make up a fifth of all the delegates, um, though there was no representation of the middle classes. Now, the PPR, because he wanted Boris to win, he did all he could to influence the election. He pointed out that Boris was the closest relative of Irina, the Tsaritsa, um, and he'd been the regent under the previous Tsar, Fyodor, uh, Boris had a son and an heir. He had experience in the role, and he was already known for foreign rulers. Um, Job even wrote a propaganda leaflet in favour of Boris, which was sent to all Russian churches to be read out um, at services, and was also read out to all the delegates at the Zemsky Sabor. Now, there were several other potential candidates for the throne, um, include, including one was Fyodor Romanov, um, um, a name who will... Well, probably encounter a bit later on. And they were backed, these other candidates were backed by Boris's enemies. But the patriarch had quickly wrapped up the seedings. And then, so on the 17th of February, 1598, Zemsky Sabor unanim unanimously elected Boris Godunov as star. And over the next few days, the patriarch led a delegation from the Zemsky Sabor to offer the crown to Boris Godunov. And eight crowds were hired to beg him to become Tsar. Um, and this was this was especially done so that he could legitimize his position as a Tsar elected by the people. And so he could reject any attempts by the other boyars to limit um, his power. Because the only problem was that in the 16th century, Russians regarded an elected Tsar as something um, almost like a violation of the laws of nature. Uh, one Russian historian, Kruchesky, wrote, to elect a Tsar was to their minds as incongruous as to elect one's own father or mother. So when pretenders appeared, um, one of them possibly set, set up by uh, the Romanists, um, even though they had a very shaky claim to the throne, the people sided, the people abandoned the elected Tsar for someone who said that he was the natural Tsar. He claimed that he was um, a murdered son of Ivan the Terrible. So in short, the Zemsky Sabor, Sabor it did technically elect Boris Godunov as star. The Democracy and the Zemsky Sabor became a tool in his hands to legitimize his route to power. It was a start, and England had not had an elected star since Harold in 1066, and um, all subsequent stars, down to Peter the Great in 1682, were in one way or another technically elected by the Zemsky 
Sabor. I was going to jump in with another question just totally off topic, but it does relate to what we're talking about. But you just answered my question because I was going to say is that next door in Poland, all our all our kings were elected. Yes. Yes. So mm-hmm. it was it was something really mm-hmm. normal, actually, by the yes, way. Exactly. So mm-hmm. my listeners, I only found this out a few years ago, which is really embarrassing because it's not obviously my time period, but it's it's very strange that suddenly they were like, oh my God, you know, how dare you elect uh, a czar? But then literally next door, everything is as normal. It's how it runs in Poland. Mm-hmm. Yes, this was completely normal. And um, for example, in Sweden, they had a law that in, in the the Swedes, it was in, in as 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 far back as 1220, the Swedes had a law that the Swedes elect their own kings, not only elect, but also depose. And um, medieval democracy has a lot of good lessons. Which leads us onto the onto the Romanovs, because obviously they, they're, they're, they're then the ruling family for the next 300 years. So I'm guessing that they're not elected uh, once they've got on. No, the Romanovs are elected. What happened was the first Romanov Tsar, Michael, was um, elected. Then all subsequent Tsars up until the time of Peter the Great. Peter the Great became emperor, so you don't elect an, em- an emperor. The emperor chooses his own uh, successor. But um, the first Tsar, Michael Romanov, um, he was elected in 1613. And the subsequent SARS after him in the 17th century were what technically elected. Obviously, the SARS eldest son was like kind of like prepared for the role. He was given the title as the heir apparent as Tsarevich. So there was never going to be any doubt about it. Um, but nevertheless, um, they were either either formally elected by the Zemsky Sabor or, for example, in, in 1682, in the case of Peter the Great, there were two brothers who contended for the throne. There was Ivan V, son of one mother, uh, Maria Miloslavskaya. Then you had uh, Peter, um, who was the son of another, um, of a, diff- a different mother, um, um, uh, uh, Natalia Merishkina. And now Ivan was the older boy, Peter was the younger. But Ivan was sickly, Peter was strong and big for his age, and so they held as Zemsky Sabor. Now it wasn't really, it's simply the crowd that was standing in just, just it, it, outside the Kremlin at that time, that the, they went out to the people, said, who do you want, Ivan or Peter? And the people said, and ch- shouted, Peter. And so in a way, again, Peter was, in that sense, elected by the people, even if it was only a very small group of people. I've just had a sudden thought. Wasn't there a similar sort of thing with the the Decemberist rebellion just after the Napoleonic Wars, where there was a choice between two czars? I, I vaguely remember seeing a mm-hmm. bit of a rumble about it, but I can't remember mm-hmm. the details. But the the army rebelled mm-hmm. because they mm-hmm. won they back the other side. Yep, it, exactly. And I can bring in a a Polish theme here because um, what happened was in um, uh, Poland by this time was it was a um, the Kingdom of Poland uh, had been given to the um, uh, Russian Empire after the Napoleonic Wars. And what happened was Alexander I, the emperor, died suddenly on the 1st of December, 1825. Now, um, during the Napoleonic Wars, um, Russian officers, they'd gone all the way to Paris, they'd been in Europe, and they'd seen how people lived better in Europe, and they'd been open to the new revolutionary ideas. And so when they came back to Russia after 1812, they, um, it, um, after 1815 rather, they uh, set up a number of secret organizations planning to try to introduce a constitution in Russia or maybe turn it into a republic. Now they were already planning to make the move when, as I said, Alexander I suddenly died. Now he didn't have any children and um, there were two brothers, um, I'd say well, three brothers, um, the next in line, Konstantin, um, he was the Viceroy of Poland. But he had married a Polish woman um, and made a Mordenatic marriage, and he had um, actually secretly abdicated his r- r- right, given up his right, but nobody knew this, not even the following brother, Nicholas. And so what happened was complete confusion because the country naturally, including Nicholas, they all took an oath to the new Tsar, Konstantin. 
whereas Constantine refused the throne and he sent back letters from Poland saying, no, 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 I've given it up. What, what nonsense is this? And um, he led Poland to taking this oath to Nicholas. So, you know, there's complete confusion. No one knew who the, the who was the Tsar, who was the head of the country. So these um, officers decided they're known as the Decembrists because it happened in December 1825. They thought, well, what we need to do is we need to exploit the situation and force the Senate to issue a manifesto calling um, representatives of the people to resolve this um, difficult situation. Um, and they sort of replaced the monarchy with a, with a provisional government, which could then have um, uh, held elections for a parliament. Um, but, and so they led on the 14th of December, they led 3,000 men onto Senate Square in the centre of St. Petersburg. But Nicholas I, um, he called up um, um, uh, 12,000 loyal troops um, and they surrounded the rebels. And after a standoff lasting whole day, they opened fire on the rebels and the rebellion was washed. I'm trying to remember the name of the film, but the Tsar, they, they opened fire with um, artillery and then the infantry run out onto the river and try to have a last stand on the frozen ice and the artillery just fires into the river. Oh, That's correct. That's and that that is what happened in, in history. They turned great shots on the on the troops on the Senate Square and then they tried to, as I say, try to go into the ice. They tried to get across the ice to the um to the fortress and sort of regroup there. But um as you say they fired cannons into the icy river and, and a lot of them drowned in the in the icy Neva. So as the, the sort of 19th century sort of kicks in, does democracy start to disappear? Because I know we're going to get to 1905 in a bit, but there's a seems to be a lack of democracy by the end of the 19th century and that people are getting quite wound up that they're not getting represented. How, how does it disappear? Or am I massively misreading it? No, that's, that's absolutely correct, because for the, for the 18th and the 19th century, you've got the Russian Empire, you've got the absolute rule of the autocratic emperors. Um, but nevertheless, there were still attempts made by people to change things, and there were even occasion, occasional flirtations of rulers themselves trying to introduce democracy or a constitution. So you would um, both attempts from, from above and from below, but none of them were successful. Um, so as, as early as, for example, in 1730, there was actually a very good chance of Russia becoming a constitutional monarchy, just as England had become in 1689 in the Glorious Revolution. Um, what happened? One of the emperors, Peter II, he was the um, grandson of Peter the Great, he died very unexpectedly, actually on the day when he was supposed to get married. So he hadn't had time to um, appoint an heir. So the Supreme Privy Council, which was meeting that day anyway for his wedding, they'd long been planning to try to um, uh, transform Russia into a constitutional monarchy. And they um, appointed as empress a woman, Anna Yanovna, um, who was she, she was a widow. Um, and she was a widow. Um, um, Duchess of Courland, and they thought, well, she'll be easy to manipulate. She's not married. She'll be glad to even to be empress. So they set her a series of conditions which would have turned uh, Russia into a constitutional monarchy. Um, she agreed to these conditions, but when she got to Moscow, then she established ties with the Imperial Guards and um, they supported her. And so she safely turned up the, she tore up the conditions and restored absolute rules. Um, so she, there's a plan for a Senate of 36 members and elected chambers of the nobility and urban classes, and this was as early as 1730. Um, but later in the 18th century, for example, you Catherine the Great, who was very liberal, but she didn't want to um, give up any of her own powers. For example, in 1762, she established a supreme legislative body called the Imperial Council to share power, but then she changed her mind and... Um, and then in 1766, she did call um, and she held a nationwide election of deputies to an assembly in Moscow. But this is only to compile a new code of laws. And when they started um, suggesting things like abolishing serfdom, then the ability told her, you know, like put a stop to these ideas. And so she dissolved the commission. Then you, um, Alexander the First, who we mentioned during about the whose whose life. Um, ended in 1825, which led to the December's revolt, 
And uh, he toyed with the idea of introducing representative government at his reign to relieve him of his duties and need to retire abroad. Um, then in 1808, he had um, an advisor, uh, Count Mikhail Speransky, brought plans for a st system like Switzerland, um, which would divide the country into administrative units, each with its own parliament, headed by an imperial Duma, meeting annually in St. Petersburg. But then again, the idea was too radical for him, and he sacked this Speransky and, um, in, in 1812. Um, then Nicholas I, um, we say he became Tsar after Alexander I in 1825. Um, he was very reactionary, and there was no progress under him. His reactionary system uh, suffered a complete catastrophe in the Crimean War, um, and he died during the war, 1855, and his son, Alexander II, saw that there had to be change. Um, he made a lot of reforms, like abolishing serfdom, but he couldn't quite bring himself to... Um, uh, to create a, a parliament. However, in, in 1880, his wife died, the empress, um, and he very quickly married his lover, a woman called Catherine, and he planned, in May 1881, he planned to simultaneously announce the granting of a constitution and the coronation of his more dynastic wife, and possibly retire with her and their young family to the south of France, and to let, um, to let up, um, first of all, have a consultative organ, which would eventually grow into a fully-fledged parliament. On the morning of the 1st of March, 1881, he signed the project for a consultative um, legislative body to be presented at the next meeting of the Council of Ministers on the 4th of March. Just two hours later, he himself was murdered by terrorist, terrorists as he drove along the Catholic, uh, uh, as he drove along the Catherine Canal in St. Petersburg. And he was succeeded by his son, Alexander III, who immediately issued, who was very reactionary, immediately issued the manifesto of unshakable autocracy, ruled in Russia for 13 years with an iron fist. And this was continued under his son, Nicholas II, although Nicholas II was not quite made up of the same um, stern stuff as his father. And he soon found that he had a revolution on his hands because he'd held back um, progress for just too long. How to sum up Russian politics and tragedies and positivities in literally five minutes. Well done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, that was very, very interesting because we're going up. That was great. But no, nope, then we go on a downer and up and down. It's, uh, it's been very interesting five minutes listening to how everything just happens, mm -hmm. then doesn't happen. It's too radical. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't fit the the the, the narrative, or uh, he, this guy thinks is is he's going to rule with an iron fist, and it's mm. very interesting actually. I think it's Russian history in a nutshell. Russia is a country of extremes, and it seems to um, shuffle from one extreme to another a lot of the time in in history. Um, although possibly, um, although sometimes I think it's worse when it doesn't shuffle quite so much and it stays on the same track. For example, um, you know, I, I lived in Russia under the Yeltsin years and it was the same thing. You would move from liberalism to conservatism and then back again. Whereas under Putin, you saw that the country was only moving in one direction and it was not a good direction. So sometimes change and even constant change can be maybe better, um, better than the entropy. 1905, we get a large amount of change. We've had the Russo-Japanese War has gone horribly, horribly wrong. And you get the 1905 rebellion. What does Nicholas do to try and change the situation and save his crown? Mm -hmm. yeah, so, um, so we've got start of the 20th century. We've got endless protests, strikes and revolutionary activities. And events come to a head on the background, as you said, of the disastrous Russo-Japanese War. Events come to a head on Sunday, the 9th of January, 1905, when striking workers marched to the Winter Palace with a petition for the Tsar, demanding limitations on the autocracy and the election of a constituent assembly. Groups opened fire on the crowd, killing several hundred people. A bloody Sunday unleashed a wave of even more strikes, riots and rebellions across the whole empire. Um, there are peasant uprisings in half of all Russia's provinces, Tsar's uncle was assassinated um, as he drove out of the Kremlin. 
the crew of the battleship Pachomkin uh, mutinied and killed their officers in the summer. And by the autumn, the whole country is paralyzed by a general strike. And you've also got the workers begin electing strike committees called Soviets, um, which even start taking power themselves in parts of the country and setting up micro-Soviet republics. So Nicholas has two options. Either appoint a military dictator and use force to crush the revolution or offer concessions. Now, as I said, he's not made of this stern stuff to either rule himself as a dictator or get one of his uh, and his relatives refused to do that. And so he chooses the latter option to, or to offer concessions. Um, and on the 17th of October, 1905, he signs a document uh, which comes known as the October Manifesto, which grants broad civil rights and an elected parliament or Duma. And the manifesto says that no law henceforth can go into force without the consent of the Duma. So Russia is now, well, at least formally on paper, a, constitu um, a constitutional monarchy. Should we touch on the First World War very briefly? Does that does that make any changes? Does that bring any positive results to Russia, uh, 1914? Because you wrote 1914, Chris, on it. Did I? Yeah. Well, yeah, the Duma, the Duma, um, in 1913, you get the 300 year celebration of Romanovs. So by the brink of the First World War, Nicholas II is back on, on high. And although the Duma isn't quite as effective from memory, uh, especially after the death of Stalipin in 1908 sort of become puppets but 1917 sorry i've taken over <laughs> go for it chris we love your knowledge <laughs> go ahead it's my i did my a levels in russian uh russian 1900 to 1953 um so yeah it's only five years ago then <laughs> <laughs> something like that not 20 but yeah um but, but the, it was uh, i think the next question i've sort of gone for was how de democratic was the duma and how effective were they before the first world war before the Germans screw everything up for everyone? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, actually, I think the clue is in the name Duma, which Nicholas cho chooses. Uh, it comes from the Russian word Dumit, meaning to think. And incidentally, it's from the same English, uh, the same root as the English word Doom, meaning to judge or pass judgment on. So it's basically Nicholas is saying, once an organ, they'll only think, pass judgment, and not do anything else. Because the Tsar, he was supposed to be a great Slavophile, but he doesn't choose the the name Zemsky Sabor, which would have been, um, you know, an assembly of the whole land. Um, I have to say that for its time, it was pretty democratic. Um, the electoral law of December 1905 gave the vote to all men over the age of 25 who met certain land or property qualifications. Now, this is only around... 15% of the population, so it was less than half the number in Britain at that time, um, and voters were divided into four classes for curie, because rural landowners, urban dwellers, peasants and workers. And there was a system of, of weighted voting which diluted the votes of the poorer sections of society. So, for example, one landowner's vote was worth the votes of 15 workers or 45 peasants. Um, the Duma, it could introduce its own legislation and it controlled the budget, but the Tsar was still in charge of foreign policy, declaring war, and he still appointed the ministers. He could dissolve or prorogue the Duma uh, at any time and issue special decrees when it was not in session, although such laws had to be later approved by the Duma. Um, Nicholas also, he, um, he diluted the Duma's powers um, before it had even met by turning his state council into an upper chamber with equal legislative rights. And um, this second house had around 200 members, half appointed by the Tsar, half elected by professional organizations. Um, but this was still better than the un completely unelected House of Lords in Britain, and no worse than the US Senate, which was not directly elected until 1913. Um, although Duma deputies, they were paid an annual salary which, which didn't happen in Britain until five years later in 1911. So it wasn't bad for its time. Um, and yes, what change did it affect? Well, so between 1906 and 1907, the Russia elected four Dumas. The first and second Dumas were dominated by radicals, and they were shut down pretty quickly by the emperor after they got out of hand. 
So although elected for five years, the first Duma only lasted 72 days and only passed one law. The second Duma lasted slightly longer, 103 days, but still only passed three bills. Then, in the so-called coup of the 3rd of June 1907, Nicholas II changed the 14 laws to the further detriment of the poorer classes and ethnic minorities. Some parts of the country, such as Central Asia, were completely disenfranchised. The result was that the third and the fourth Dumas were more conservative, and because no longer represented the wider population, public interest in parliamentary politics gave way to apathy and indifference. On the other hand, um, this is this is also a quite interesting philosophical question if you believe in evolution or revolution, because it did mean that the Duma, for example, the third Duma, it could now work constructively with the government to pass laws for the good of Russia. Now, a lot of good initiative was actually coming from the executive um, the Tsarist government, like for, and you mentioned, for example, Stalin and his agrarian reforms. Um, this was coming from the, the executive, but still need the consent of the Duma to become law. So the Duma was working with Stalin, you know, to pass good laws. Um, but there are also other examples when the initiative came from the Duma itself. Uh, for example, the Third Duma voted large sums of money for a 15-year expansion of the school education system up until 1922. And although we know a lot about how after the revolution, you know, the new Soviet regime did a lot about um, battling illiteracy, but this program was already underway by uh, um, put in, into operation by the Duma. The Duma also passed laws providing workers with protection, such as national insurance. Um, this was a time of the arms and naval race, you know, the, the dreadnought race in Britain, same in Russia. And the Duma actually frequently recommended military expenditure even higher than the sums proposed by the war ministry. And um, then in 1908, for example, even to make the military better, the Duma forced the resignation of three grand dukes who held high military offices. And they also investigated in 1912, there was a massacre of striking miners at the Lena gold fields in Siberia. And they um, held an investigation for the resignation of the Minister of the Interior, um, Alexander Makarov. Then the fourth Duma, it was also conservative, but it even, but even it um, increasingly moved into opposition against the government and the Tsar, especially on constitutional issues. And in March 1914, there was an event which was a little like um, the events which kicked off the English Civil War in 1641. Um, because the government attempted to prosecute the leader of the Mensheviks, Karl Schietze, after he made a speech calling for a republic. The case was dropped after all the other factions came together to support him, and the Duma passed a vote of no confidence in the government. And um, so the Duma was already it was acting in a way that the Zemsky Sabor never did in medieval times, and it was coming together to oppose the Tsar's government as a single body expressing the will of the people. Although all these um, conflicts, they were all forgotten when Germany declared war on Russia in the summer of um, 1914, then the Duma unanimously uh, passed the um, government uh, budget. Um, although the five Bolsheviks, they did vote against it, and they were actually um, later arrested for treason and sent, sent to Siberia. <laughs> Both of us are looking at each other as if we're going to ask the next question. But Okay, 1917, um, uh, the glorious German army and Austro-Hungarians have uh, conquered large swathes of Russia. And Yay! Nicholas... <laughs> yeah, to the German victory. Uh, so, and, um, oh no, boo to the German victory! <laughs> I was confused. But Nicholas's government collapses, he goes into exile, um, into exile, forced to abdicate, and you get the provisional government. How effective were they at bringing greater democracy and uh, how did it pan out for them and Kerensky? I would say they were very effective. The um, only problem was they should have moved sooner um, to secure democracy because they moved um, they didn't move quickly enough and they allowed the Bolsheviks to seize power. Um, that's it in short. So um, basically, so in February 1917, a uh, revolution happens completely by chance, taking the revolutionaries by surprise as much as anyone else. Um, so you've got um, a combination of factory strikes and discontent over bread shortages spark mass demonstrations on the streets, probably for an end to the democracy. 
the Cossacks sent to disperse the crowds um, refused to obey orders, and the city garrison mutinies and goes over to the side of the demonstrators. So the regi regime simply collapses, leaving a vacuum of power. Fortunately, you've got the Duma, and so the Duma steps in um, um, to build that vacuum of power. Actually, as one, uh, as one conservative member of the Duma said to the chairman, um, Mikhail Radzianko, and he said, take power, because if you don't, others will. So the Duma elected a provisional government, which assumed power, and um, they secured the abdication of Nicholas II. Now, the first decision of the new government was to promise full civil rights and also the election of a constituent assembly to decide the new form of government for Russia. Would it be a constitutional monarchy or a republic or whatever? At the same time, you've got the workers and the soldiers repeating the experience of 1905 and recreating the Petrograd Soviet, um, which sits alongside the provisional government as a sort of alternative and rival source of power. In a way, this is good because this is democracy, because the Duma was really only voted in by the middle classes, where, where you've got the Soviet representing the workers and the soldiers. Uh, this period becomes known as dual power. Um, and although the, the, the Soviet often issued decrees which contradicted the provisional government, the two bodies cooperated on writing the law governing the election to the Constituent Assembly, because everyone agrees that we need democracy and we want democracy. Under this new electoral law, um, um, the, the vote was given to all men and women who had reached the age of 20, and this was far ahead of any Western country, you to for anything similar, you to wait until 1920 in the United States, 1928 in Britain, and even 1944 in France, and um, before women were given the vote. Um, the problem was the the provisional government it only held the elections in November 1917 instead of straight away. By this time, the Bolsheviks had already seized power in October 1917. But the elections, nevertheless, the elections still go ahead because Bolsheviks only hold power in Petrograd and in some other, some a few other cities in Russia at that time. Um, and the constituent assembly elections, it's the largest election in history and it's the world's greatest exercise of universal suffrage, all in the middle of winter, during the, when Russia is still fighting the First World War in a country with limited infrastructure and only a fortnight after the Bolsheviks have seized power. Then the elections are held on a territory six times the size of Europe, over 11 time zones, from the Arctic Circle in the north down to Manchuria in the east, and Russia occupied Turkey and Iran in the west, and even the Russian troops serving in France and Greece. Uh, the logistics, they were incredible. The electoral law had to be published in 16 languages, uh, while 100 million identity documents and a billion ballot papers had to be printed. But they still go ahead with this. Um, and also, the majority of people, don't forget, they're voting for the very first time. Uh, Russia has no prior experience of universal direct equal or secret um, uh, elections. Um, so the elections take place. Um, they're won by the socialist revolutionaries who um, they back, they, they're the Peasants' Party, they take about 40% of the vote, with the Bolsheviks only in second place in, uh, on, a, on around 22%. Um, uh, but um, instead of accepting the results and saying, OK, we came second this time, maybe we'll be first next time, which might actually have happened anyway, the Bolsheviks um, closed down the Constituent Assembly when things do not go their way at the assembly on the very first and the only day it sat on the 5th of January, 1918. So they shut down the assembly, uh, they keep power for themselves and uh, the whole country descends into civil war. Do I get to ask the communism question? Yeah, go for it. Yes. I've got a Fantastic, on the great. Once cut out, once <laughs> <laughs> so, Chris has purposely put here 1953. I'm not going to ask him what happens in 1953 because we all should know. If you don't know what happened in 1953, I'll tell you. It was the death of Comrade Stalin, which changed Europe, the Soviet Union and everything and uh, gave Poland a slightly brighter future. Marginally. I, I put it in because it's my mum's birthday. Oh, <laughs> kidding. 
kidding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it is my mum's birthday. Okay, Mom. so the workers, Soviet workers, communism gives you a apparent, I'm going to put this in quotations, greater promise of uh, greater representation of the people. <laughs> Sorry, that's a laugh. Uh, how effective was it before 1953, before the tyrant Stalin parted, departed this world? Okay, so um, as we've seen, the Soviets, um, or councils of workers, deputies, they sprang up during the 1905 revolution. Now, they emerged from the domestic Russian tradition, the same tradition as the Vecha, which we were, which we talked about right at the, the start, or the village assembly. Now, they're a uniquely Russian phenomenon, so they've got nothing to do with Western Marxism. Um, and at first, Lenin, and who in 1905, he's sitting in Switzerland, don't forget, Lenin and other exiled Marxists, they don't actually fully understand these Soviets, and they try to associate them with the Paris Commune. And it was only after some Soviets started to depose the <coughs> pardon, started to depose the local authorities in 1905 and established independent statehoods that Lenin spotted their potential as the embryo of a new organ of power. So Soviets, they can have both executive and representative functions. They're an alternative model to parliamentary democracy without the flowery language or the convoluted debate of the parliamentary chamber. And um, that's one of the many reasons why the Reds won the Civil War, because the masses better understood the Soviets as organs of direct democracy. The decisions taken in the Soviets, they were blunt and based on common sense. And what happened was, and so the Soviet model was used in Russia from 1917 right up until 1993. The only problem was that while, while representatives of all the socialist parties had previously been elected to the Soviets, the Bolsheviks now began to uh, persecute, clamp down, and to basically ban all the other parties. So while the new constitution of 1918 proclaimed that all power belonged to the Soviets, this meant that all power really belonged to the one Communist Party, where there was even less freedom after Lenin banned factions in 1921. Incidentally, there was one alternative to that in, in Ukraine at that time. Nestor mm -hmm. Makhno, an anarchist, um, set up a, an anarchist state, or rather non-state, called the Free Territory. And they also had Soviets, but there you were, the members of the Soviets were banned from being a member of a political party. But in Russia, Soviets, um, you could only have, um, uh, as I say, um, in the early 19, from the early 1920s onwards, there was just the one party, the Communist Party. So instead of a dictatorship of the proletariat, you actually had a dictatorship of the Communist Party. Now, this crushing of democracy and the rapid rise of a new bureaucratic elite inside the party led to a wave of rebellions by those who'd previously fought for the Reds, um, such as the sailors of Kronstadt or the peasants of Hamburg province. They all had their political slogans were all for the Soviets without communists or all power to the Soviets and not the Communist Party. But they were all crushed by the communists by 1921, um, including with the use of chemical weapons. Now, the vote was given under Lenin to all workers and peasants aged 18. There was a whole category of people called Lishensi who were deprived of the vote including rich peasants and um, employers of hard labor, and of course, anyone linked to the former regime, such as uh, members of the Tsar's police or the Orthodox Church. In some parts of the country in the 1920s, up to half the population was denied the vote. Now this, changed, um, this was changed by Stalin, who said in 1934 that socialism had now been established, and so the new constitution of 1936 gave the vote to everybody. But there was still no choice, because the constitution had a clause providing for the existence of only one party, the Communist Party. Uh, and actually, this was much criticised abroad, and just, um, just for balance, I'll give you what Stalin's answer was. He said that um, because it, he said in... Um, in the West, in democracies, you have um, conflicting classes, and so you can have, have more than one party there representing each class. But in the Soviet Union, he said, um, 
there's um, there's only two classes: the workers and peasants who are who have no who are friendly, who have no clash at all. Um, and so uh, there's no ground in the USSR for the existence of several parties, just the one party, the Communist Party. Um, although, um, incidentally, um, after you said um, after 1953, when um, uh, eventually uh, Khrushchev came to power, um, he was overheard in 1964, uh, making the suggest shortly before he was actually removed from power, suggesting that um, uh, he might split the one communist party into this into two parties: a party for the worker and a party for the peasants. Uh, but this never happened, and the communist party um, remained in uh, in, in, in the Soviet Union as a sole party uh, right up until the reforms of Gorbachev in the late 1980s. Which leads us up to Perestroika. Uh, quite nicely. What effect did that have? Because we 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 now see the, the end of communism on the horizon and a move towards more Western style democracy. What's interesting, a bit like nineteen seventeen, it was actually completely unplanned. Because you think, what effect did Perestroika have? Well, ultimately, it led to the end of uh, a totalitarian state and the re- replacement of the dictatorship of the Communist Party with a multi-party democracy. Uh, of course, it also led to the end of that state, although whether or not that's because the Soviet Union could not inherently function as a democracy and the two things were ultimately incompatible, that's a, maybe a discussion for another day. Um, so basically, perestroika, it means restructuring and this official state policy of the Soviet Union under Mikhail Gorbachev from January 1987. Now, first, Gorbachev, he only wanted to tinker with the economy and modernise the Soviet Union by introducing incentives, reducing inefficiencies, you say, making socialism work a little bit better. He himself, he was a completely orthodox communist who had no plans to introduce democracy. Although having said that, um, he had been identified back in 1983, um, two years before he became leader, by Margaret Thatcher, or rather by an academic, um, Archibald Hayward Brown, at a special seminar at Chequers. Um, he'd been identified as the best educated member of the Politburo um, who, in the hope of effecting change from the top down rather than the bottom up, as had happened in the Prague Spring of 1968. Um, and that's why Thatcher found a way to invite Gorbachev to Britain in 1984. And that's how he first became known to the West, actually before he became leader in 1985. Anyway, Gorbachev starts these reforms, but after he encounters what he believes to be resistance inside the party to these very limited economic reforms, now um, there are many reasons for their failure, it was mainly the falling price of oil, but he became convinced that he could not rely on the party apparatus, he would sabotage his reforms, and that he had to mobilise the human resources that were lying outside the party by handing real power to the people. Of course, he argued, maybe he was even telling himself, that he was simply returning the country to the days immediately after the revolution, saying it was a transfer of power from the Communist Party, from the one rule of the Communist Party, into the hands of those to whom it should belong, according to the Constitution, to the Soviets. So in 1987, he held, first he held a small experiment in free elections when voters went to the polls to elect new district, urban and rural Soviets. Only 5% of these local elections, instead of the usual single candidate, the ballot paper would contain more than one name. So the, for the first time in Soviet history, some voters were being offered a choice. This experiment, it was um, pronounced to be a success, and in 1988, Gorbachev enshrined free elections in law. Um, and I'm going to be a bit cynical here and say, yes, it's very good um, Gorbachev being a Democrat, but it actually, he was a politician, don't forget, and this would be an added advantage of giving him an alternative power base allowing him to bypass the growing opposition to his policies inside the Communist Party, where hardliners were angry that he was voluntarily giving up power. And for Shop being um, removed by the Communist Party in 1964, Gorbachev did not want the same thing to happen to him. So he, if he had an apparent power base, then he could not be removed from power. So the following year, 1989, instead of re-electing the old Supreme Soviet of the USSR, Country voted for a new organ called the Congress of People's Deputies. This was actually something like the old Zemsky Sabor. It was an assembly representing the whole of Soviet society. 
Some delegates were appointed by organizations, while others were uh, directly elected in multi-candidate constituencies. And uh, Gorbachev also used this assembly to have himself indirectly elected as president of the USSR, giving him a new title and additional job security. Now, the only problem was that when the following year, all the union republics elected their own Republican congresses, separatist, par separatist parties came to power in many of these assemblies, such as Lithuania. They started declaring independence or re-independence. Gorbachev tried to hold the union together by negotiating a new union treaty and giving it to the people in a referendum in March 1991. First time the Soviet Union had ever held a referendum, had ever asked people anything, and incidentally it's also the first time um, American political consultants were used in the Soviet Union because um, President Bush um, had actually sent Gorbachev, an American expert on referendums, find ways to boost the yes vote. Um, now, although only nine of the 15 republics took part in the vote, as the other said, we're, we've already decided we're going to leave the Soviet Union, the yes vote still wins. And so it's agreed that the, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics will be replaced by a new Union of Sovereign States. Now, the signing of the new Union Treaty is scheduled for the 20th of August, 1991. But on the eve of the signing, Bob job was overthrown by hardliners. Of Moscow and other large cities, they take to the streets to defend their democratic freedoms and their democratically elected leaders, and so the coup is defeated by the people. And um, incidentally, there were also um, suspicions that Gorbachev had himself a hand in, in the coup because there's obviously going to be a new union with a different name, and he would have to face a direct presidential election. And um, he had falling ratings at that time. And so many thought that he organized this coup or he had a finger in it um, so that he could um, uh, stay in power and uh, hold the union together. Um, and he was acting a bit like like in 1917, you mentioned earlier in Gerenski. For example, in August 1917, there was a revolt against him, um, the Cornel revolt. And people also suspect Gerenski of doing the same of his that Gorbachev might have done, that was that he gave a secret command to hardliners to restore order, but then took fright at the last minute and appealed to the democratic forces in to save him, only to let these same democratic forces remove him from power. Because that is what happened to Gorbachev. Although he he um he came through the military coup, and um, later that year, December 1991, he actually faced a second coup, this time a political coup, um, when the leaders of uh, Russia, Belarus and Ukraine um, came together secretly and um, got to get rid of Gorbachev by creating their own union called the Commonwealth of Independent States. So Gorbachev was now out of a job and he resigned as president of a country, the Soviet Union, which no longer existed. Um, so, Perestroika ended the country they were supposed to save, although um, still this was a country which ended its life as a democracy after beginning, after um, starting out life as a dictatorship. Wow, this has been really amazing. We've covered about a thousand years of history. <laughs> and it's, um, <laughs> it's been really, uh, really learned quite a lot. Um, oh, by the way, I Googled it. The name of that film was uh, Union of Salvation. Mm -hmm. Up on YouTube and type in Union of Salvation, Decemberist Canon, and they've got the whole scene. It's, it's haunting. But um, but th thanks ever so much for coming to talk to us today. Can you remind everyone uh, the title of your book and where they can get it from? Yeah, so the title of the book, um, When Russia Did Democracy, um, I believe it officially it's not out until January, although I know books have been printed and they're in the warehouses, probably making their way to bookshops at the moment. So you can get it in any high street bookshop. I know you can definitely order it now from the publisher, Amberley Publishing, on their homepage, and it will also be coming out. It's available now in hardback and also available in electronic forms as well. And we'll uh, we'll get it up on the uh, the history hack bookshop, so that way um, we the podcast will get a small slice of it, and you get a larger slice of it, slice of the money. And uh, no one who owns a popular internet bookshop can uh, fly to the moon next year on it. <laughs>
But uh, thank you ever so much mm -hmm. for coming today. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books, you can support them, and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.